Good evening, Margaret. Um, there's a Dublin phrase, um, you're in your granny's. It means you're home. I feel like I'm home now. Thank you all so very, very much. Lord Mayor, Jerry Breen, City Manager, John Tierney, City Librarian, Margaret Hayes, Cultural Ambassador, uh, Gabriel Byrne, Dini Ushla, Gurev Mila Magwith, Galer, Asuach Dandusha, Avranu Uram, Imas Mamwinter Fane, August McClan Fane, August McCorja Fane, Tommy Intok, Intok, Broad Julos, Tom McQuid Gwelga, on Quidis Modem McGwelga, Kyle Chugum, Tom Bronerm, Ock, and Ishta, on Quidis Modem McBearla, Kyle Chugum, Freshen. I basically just said uh, that I am completely floored by this. Uh, I am stunned and exhilarated and proud and most of all humbled. Um, and I mean truly humbled and very nervous. Humbled uh, not just by the experience of being here, but by the whole history, local and international, that this uh, award encompasses. All the writers, all the readers, all the libraries, all the guests here tonight, um, and all the writers down through the years that have written about or dreamed about this very fine city of ours and this country of literature. So I'd like to say in deepest thanks and talk uh, a little bit about Dublin, the city itself, and all the Dublins that are found around the world, the imagined, the dreamt, the forgotten. I'd like also to talk about libraries, and fathers and mothers and children and those we love and how they guide us into the future by giving us access to the past. That we who are here because we were given our voice by many, many, many others. But before that, I do that, I want to mention that I was on a spectacular list of writers whom I love and admire. Over a hundred that came down to ten, including two Irishmen, William Trevor and Colm Tobin. And then there was Michael Crummy, Barbara Kingsolver, Yi Yun Lee, David Malouf, Joyce Carol Oates, Craig Sylvie, and Evie Wilde. So, my sincere thanks uh, to the nominating libraries who put my name forward, along with all the other names. And my thanks to the outstanding uh, uh, jury in terms of their work that they do outside of this, and also the work that they den then did uh, with, with this award. Um, I promise uh, there were no brown envelopes involved. Um, but no, it's an enormous amount of work, and I'm deeply, deeply grateful. Um, two years ago, uh, after I'd finished writing my novel, Let the Great World Spin, I fell ill for a little while, and I ended up in hospital in New York City for a couple of weeks. And I had a chance to bring a book with me, and so uh, I took along Joyce's Ulysses. I'd read it before, of course, but only in spurts and bits and pieces, never the full journey. And so I sat there in that hospital bed, and I read. I descended the stairhead. I ate with relish the inner organs of beasts and fowls. I wandered along Eccles Street. I glimpsed what Leopold couldn't experience anymore. I inherited the book and inhabited the book. In fact, I was even here in the Oak Room, in this very place, the Mansion House. And I moved through what I would call probably the greatest compendium of human experience ever written. And then at one stage, early one afternoon, an anonymous little moment, my uh, late grandfather climbed out of the book into the hospital room and sat himself down at the side of my bed. I mean this in a very real sense. It felt like a physical presence. I knew it was him, even though I'd only met him once, 30 years beforehand. Now, sure enough, there was a little bit of morphine involved, <laughs> a little bit of Percocet. But the thing was, there he was, my grandfather, my father's father, uh, Jack McCann, with his hat on his knee, his suit jacket crumpled, flakes of tobacco in his pocket, and he just sat there alongside me, and he watched me read. And I was, in fact, I think, reading him. 
The deeper I got into the novel, the more alive my dead grandfather became. What I mean is that the book transported me to Dublin on June 16, 1904, a year my own great-grandfather and my grandfather, a boy then, would have walked these very streets. I was there with them. They were spectators to that book, and somehow they were carrying me along. River run, river run. For me, Ulysses is the greatest of all books, and it creates the most viable of worlds. But then again, all books do this, or all books should want to do this. This is the value of literature, plays, poems, journalism, biography, that curious word, fiction. Literature can carry us to the far side of our bodies. We can become alive in another way. Perhaps literature doesn't cure anything, but it is, on its deepest level, an inner need that is designed to refuse despair. Is that enough? Well, yeah, I think it is enough. I believe in the power of the story. I believe part of our peace process here in Ireland came through poetry. I believe that we value our lives more profoundly because we have the likes of the theatre companies that we have, the Abbey, the Druid, the Gate, uh, places like Fighting Words, Roddy Doyle's Fighting Words. I think we keep the wounds of emigration closed by having our centres in London, in New York, in Melbourne. I don't think we could shoulder our current difficulties unless we thought there was a word waiting around the corner, a Heaney word or a Marina Carr play or a Bulger sentence. It's an incredible thing for me to think about what we can experience uh, through literature. We can experience violence but not carry the scars. Uh, we can go on an extensive journey of joy. We can inhabit a landscape that others before us have even ruined. We can learn how to live in a place even if we aren't there. Literature gives us access to a re very real history. We are allowed to become the other that we never dreamed that we could be. It's the best democracy that we have. The things that we tell one another the things that we want to tell one another, they survive. Not even sickness, not war, and not even death can take our stories and our words away. What is your nation? Leopold Bloom is asked this in Barney Kiernan's pub on the long gone Little Britain Street, not far from here, 107 years ago. And a nation, says Bloom, is the same people living in the same place. Be God then, says one of the characters in the pub, I'm a nation, for I've been living in the same pace for the past five years. And then Bloom, he amends it, and he says, are also living in different places. So, what is our nation? All of us living in different places. I never left this country. I've been away, but I never left it. I've always been here, even when I was away. I'm like countless millions of others who have made our country into a global elsewhere. I'm so very proud of it. I'm not unaware of its faults, its follies, but we've had enough talk about that in recent times. Jeez, if I had to talk about my own faults and follies, we'd be here all night too. Um, but we are the accumulation of our voices, the ones we hear, the ones we've heard, and the ones we've yet to hear. The real beauty of literature is that in its mystery, it has been able to join us all together. To be Irish and to get this award well, I'm doubly, triply, quadruply proud. An international award in my hometown in the year that we become the UNESCO City of Literature. It makes me, yeah, uh, well, it, it makes me a little bit teary. I uh, know it, it doesn't make me teary. I don't know, um, <laughs> but it does. It does a little bit. I mean, I couldn't have dreamed this. I honestly could not have dreamed this, and that's why it seems that I have to say that it belongs to so many others. So that financial analyst from Cork who's living in Paris, or that bricklayer from Limavady uh, who's living in Cairo, and that young dancer from Castlebar plying his trade in Barcelona, and that rad radical Jesuit priest in Mexico, and that violinist in Milwaukee, all those Irish voices that have been scattered all over the place, those we hear and those we don't, I'd like to say, say thank you to them for giving us a whole new accent. And so I say, I'm not sure that this award belongs to me. I'm indebted to an extended diasporic nation, so many people, a myriad of voices. 
Sure, I get some of my voice from Joyce and I steal a line or two. Though in truth, I think everything I write sits in his shade. But I get it from Ben Kiley. I get it from Jennifer Johnston, from Paul Muldoon, Edna O'Brien, from a list of writers I shouldn't mention because I'm sure if I went on and on I'd leave someone off the list. And I don't want to do that. But I also get my voice from this city where I grew up. I get it from New York. I get it from the libraries and the librarians who so generously allow the spectacular collision of voices every single day in different parts of the world. I get it from my friends. I get it from, I get it from my teachers. In fact, there's, I have two teachers uh, who, who taught me here tonight. Uh, Brother Kelly from Clonkeen College and um, Pat O'Connell from St. Bridget's National School. Thank you. Stand up. See, the thing is, our teachers, our librarians, our public servants and, and, and people who, who do that sort of anonymous work, they are the ones who voice us. Um, they give us access to what I would call that grounded democracy, not something flighty or ridiculous, but something on the level, on the boards, something true, in the shoes, the people who do the real work that isn't always sung. I'm lucky to be sung, but I hope to be able to sing about them. So too for uh, people in the literary world, and particularly tonight, uh, my publishers, Alexandra Pringle from, from Bloomsbury, and Jennifer Hershey from Random House in New York. And everyone here on the ground uh, who sells the books, and especially the people in Rep Force and Cormac Kinsella. And th thank you all so much. <laughs> Deepest thanks, honest thanks. And then there's the readers. Um, the truth is that I'm nothing without my readers. And readers are always wiser than their writers. I try to create a landscape, however flawed, and they inhabit it. But I want to say that I wrote this story in response to 9-11 and what happens with that strange involuntary muscle that we call the heart. I believe in optimism as an antidote to cynicism. I don't think optimism is easy. Far from it. In fact, I think the best optimists are cynics first, but they're grown-up cynics, if you will. There's no point flailing about talking only about the dark. The fact is that the light belongs to the small, anonymous moments, and we can't always see it, but it's there. We have to acknowledge the dark and get through it. A few weeks ago here, uh, Obama said, um, is Fagerlin, you know, yes, we can. And I think that all of us would add, fair enough, that's good, you know, it's fine, it's Fagerlin, yes, we can. But it's not only yes, we can, but yes, we must. Nach kinta gagahamid. Because there's a moral force in being allowed to tell your story. The late, great John McGahern used to say that the universal is the local with the walls removed. It has been long so for literature. It hasn't always been so for politics or business. But I don't know much about politics or business and I don't really care to know much about politics or business right now. Yet I do know that the purpose of literature is to try to knock down the walls and keep what is treasured within. I treasure that I have been taught and allowed to deal with words here in this country and in my family. Our education system and our library system and our arts councils, who gave me a grant really, really early on, and our attitudes towards art in this place, in this country, have allowed that. They've been our scaffolds, these people, not in a high-minded way, but also as entertainment. Let us not forget that it's also a good thing to have a laugh. Right? I treasure the fact uh, that I was allowed uh, to go abroad without any rancor, and still maintain my Irishness and come back and raise a glass tonight. It seems to me that that's the height of generosity to watch someone go and then have the beauty to invite them back. Um, I think we have to hang on to that very much. So I know I'm up here singing to the choir, but Christ, we have to look after our young artists. Uh, it's wonderful to see uh, Daniel here from Malaysia tonight. And um, thank you all for the support that you've done uh, for the arts. My gratitude is endless. And last, but certainly not least, there are those to whom I'm most deeply indebted, 
The voices may not appear on the actual pages of my work, but they are there in the way the words are placed. And they were ones who gave me the voices from the very beginning. My mum, Sally McCann, from Derry, who used to bring me up to Derry a, 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 as a child. My father, Sean McCann, as a journalist and an author, a fantastic journalist and author in his own right. And also the man who fathered this rose called Bloomsday. Um, <laughs> there they are right there. Oh, he'd, he'd, stand up, he'd stand up only for he was disco dancing last night and he ended up in that little chair. Uh, no, but there are my brothers and sisters, uh, my extended family, um, there are my own children, uh, Christian, Johnny Michael and Isabella back in New York and most of all, most of all, there's my wife Alison, my first and most eloquent voice, who wishes that she was here tonight, but as a teacher and as a mother, she's busy looking after other voices, but she is here, like we're all here in so many ways, um, and I will raise a glass of deepest thanks to her and to everyone else. Gorev Mila Magwev Galer. Thank you.